everybody. Welcome to the Sustainability in Motion podcast, brought to you by ED4S. We focus on the fast-moving sustainability world to help the business community better understand the sustainability and environmental challenges we face. I'm Matt Orsog, Chief Content Officer at ED4S. And I'm Noah Alsaidi, Founder and CEO of Canada Advisors and Senior Advisor to ED4S. Today we're going to talk to Natasha Chaudhry, Research Fellow at the Institute for Climate Economics. You may know it better as I4CE. We're going to talk to Natasha today about stranded assets. A couple months ago, Natasha authored a paper, From Stranded Assets to Asset Risk, Reframing the Narrative for European Private Financial Institutions, that really dives deeper into the issue of stranded assets than most of us think about. Welcome to the podcast, Natasha. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for having me. I know what. All right. Now, you know, most people listening have heard about stranded assets, but let's, let's level set to start off. Can you explain the concept of stranded assets as it's utilized today? Where does it come from and how is it utilized? Yeah, sure. So theoretically, the concept has probably been around for quite a long time, but practically it started gaining traction since about the last decade, uh, a little before the Paris Agreement, the years 2012, 2013, 2014, uh, a lot of pioneering work done by the University of Oxford on this topic, and they've been leading the charge on that. And the topic became relevant uh, precisely like around this time, mainly because of the link uh, with the fossil fuel industry, of course, and the emission intensity of that to global warming and people becoming more aware of that. And that's how the Paris Agreement, of course, came to materialize as well. But it was very uh, directly and inherently linked with the carbon bubble. So the concept of the carbon bubble is that eventually uh, a, lot of, a lot of these proven coal, oil and gas reserves that beef and oil and gas industries own today. So they are the proprietary owners of these and also some of the uh, government-owned or national oil companies. They would eventually need to be stranded. So what that means is uh, you would no longer be able to extract these, exploit these, burn them uh, because of some kind of full change that came about in the market. Uh, this would normally be a regulatory change, some kind of a policy, a uh, complete ban on oil and gas usage in, in the new economy. These kind of situations that became, uh, these kind of scenarios rather that became more plausible, uh, became more important in the mainstream discussion around climate right around the time of the Paris Agreement. And so this carbon bubble concept became more predominant. And with that, of course, came the concept of, okay, so stranded, asset stranding is a, is, a, is a real thing. This could happen eventually because of these different uh, drivers that would cause us to, to, to strand these assets, to leave them in the ground and not exploit them anymore. And so the bubble, again, is related to how an asset bubble works. So you don't, completely price in this future risk in the current value of this asset. And so the bubble basically is the fact that the, the value of these proven oil and gas reserves that would need to be stranded isn't fully reflected in the balance sheet of the oil and gas companies because, yeah, they provision for it, they've got asset impairment provisions on, on all of that stuff. But again, it's because there aren't any clear policy signals telling them that from this date, from this particular year, you cannot exploit these oil and gas reserves, it's very uncertain. So the bubble gets created because we're not really completely pricing in these risks. And so this is how asset stranding is generally is understood today by the oil and gas uh, companies, particularly by the financial industry, um, very strongly linked to the fossil fuel sector, very strongly linked to this concept of carbon bubble. Following uh, that, we've also had a lot of work by the Carbon Tracker Initiative, which is another think tank that works on decarbonizing the oil and gas industry. And they've done some fantastic work on asset stranding as well. I like how they describe these three different factors for asset stranding. So not just policy and regulatory stranding, which would be, again, some kind of a ban, some kind of a very strict policy uh, directive, but also physical stranding that can come from simply physical climate events like floods, droughts, physical events that would not let you operate a particular asset anymore because it's been destroyed. Uh, and also economic stranding that just comes from changes in the market. Uh, people not wanting to buy this anymore because it's it's not cost efficient. You know, all these different kind of market factors. And uh, this is important to specify because we're talking about asset stranding in this context when I, when I, when I write about it in the paper. So yeah, that, that's pretty much uh, how it's evolved since 2012, 2013 up until now and where we stand right now on this topic on the financial institution point of view. All right. That's very helpful, uh, Natasha. And actually, before I ask my question, I, I mean, I got to say, I just love the paper. It's incredibly well written, very insightful on a, on a quite a complex topic. I mean, thank you for, for putting it together. But now that we have an understanding of what stranded assets are, let's explore what's wrong with stranded assets from your perspective. Um, because in your paper, you argue that the stranded asset concept, at least in relation to European banks, is too narrow. 
you argue instead uh, uh, we need a different concept or you propose a different concept called assets at risk. Can you explain this new concept maybe in more detail and why do you think it's better framing than uh, the stranded assets, a concept that you just went through? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Tamar, for the question, because that's really the crux of the paper. <laughs> it's literally the title of the paper. But yeah, one thing I want to clarify before completely getting into the answer of that question, because it's a long answer, but also to say that, as you mentioned, the paper does target European banks here, because eventually their aim is to influence European policymakers. So the EBA, the European Banking Authority, the ECB, all of the other regulators and supervisors in the financial industry. Uh, but again, it's not idiosyncratic to European banks. This applies to any financial institution anywhere in terms of you know the way we understand standard assets today and what I am proposing in terms of let's look at assets at risk. So with that, why I decided to uh, frame it in this sense um, and, to, and to say that, hey, okay, we have standard assets and this is the way we understand it today, but this is not sufficient. I need to start looking at it in a much wider way is because it follows from what I mentioned in my, my previous answer. Uh, stranded assets today are very like very directly linked with fossil fuels, with the carbon bubble. So it's only looking at a very small part of the problem. It's like the tip of the iceberg. You're not looking at the rest of it, uh, rest of it in the sense that theoretically it's not even linked to any particular sector. The stranding risk is really just an unanticipated loss in the value of an asset from some particular external driver. Right? It doesn't say anywhere that it's coming from fossil fuels or something. We've linked it that way because of the very evident link with the fossil fuel industry. But it is very agnostic, theoretically. And so the point is to say, let's apply that agnostic uh, theory in practice and, and let's look at it across sectors because this is not limited to the fossil fuel sector. We're seeing this across sectors everywhere. So it's about understanding how stranding risk is actually a transition-driven risk as we decarbonize across sectors. Uh, various sectors are facing different kinds of decarbonizing pressures, different kinds of transitioning these pressures coming from policy and markets and legal and all of these different pressures. And they could they could face devaluation, whether permanently or, or temporarily, whether partially or fully, because again, asset stranding is not just something going from, I don't know, one billion to just zero the very next stage. It's also a partial devaluation. But the whole point is that it's sudden because you didn't anticipate it, you didn't see this coming. And so now you have a financial loss. And whether you're the you're the person or the you're the entity owning that actual physical asset, or you're the financial institution who's linked to that through whatever loan or bond or financial instrument that you're connected with that particular entity. But the the point is that it's unanticipated, and so I I felt the need to open this uh, prism, this narrative, because it's just it, it's too narrowly understood today. The way we look at stranded assets in the financial industry is that a it's through the lens of the fossil fuel sector. B, it's through the lens of quantification. We say, okay, we understand there's a carbon bubble. We know there are going to be, okay, certain proven reserves of oil and gas that will need to be stranded. So let's try and quantify that. Great, that's a good thing to do. But you're going to, the problem with that is, again, because of that uncertain policy signal telling you when these assets will need to be stranded, you could have various different methodological approaches. And with that come the data challenges, the uncertainty, the, the methodological challenges as well, because you have everybody using different approaches, different assumptions. And so eventually you, you end up with a plethora of estimates of these losses. So it's not even the quantification exercise is not really going to lead you to something that's a standard, that's replicated, but it's going to be everybody having different approaches and therefore different different values of the eventual asset funding. So rather than turning around and being so focused on quantification, Let's look at this in a more proactive sense where we're saying, okay, we understand that the quantification exercise is going to be limited precisely because of these uncertainty and data challenges. Let's look at it more proactively. Let's say, okay, we, we know this is impossible to, to completely quantify accurately. Let's apply a proactive lens where we anticipate, first of all, we identify these risks, these potential assets at risk, therefore, because they're not stranded here, they're assets which are at risk of eventual stranding, driven by so-and-so decarbonizing pressures or transition pressures. Let me try and identify these assets at risk in my financial portfolio. And then let me see how I can mitigate that in a proactive way. So rather than simply trying to quantify that and then create some buffers and provisions to, to buffer myself from that, from that shock, let me see how I can engage as a financial institution, how I can really use my agency to help this particular entity, whether it's a government, whether it's a corporate, to really transform their business. Because the point is also to deploy those transition finance flows. It's not just to stay limited to risk management, which is just you as a financial institution trying to kind of risk diversification, divestment, whatever that might be, but not necessarily helping to decarbonize the real economy. See what I mean? So it's about seeing, okay, can we do both? We need, we need a two-pronged approach here. And that is what this concept of assets at risk can help you do 
whereas stranded assets traditionally as a sudden stood cannot help you with that because that's very static and, and narrow. That is just telling you, okay, fossil fuels, we quantify it, we buffer this. It doesn't do anything with the transition finance part of it. But stranded, but assets at risk can do that because it's a two-pronged approach. It tells you, okay, quantify, but don't get caught up in that. Try to look at this proactively, try to anticipate it, try to buffer this as much as you can in terms of the risk management point of view. But more importantly, Try to deploy the strategy finance flow so that you're re early, you're retiring what needs to be retired. So what's no longer compatible with the low carbon transition or so managed phase out typically. You are transforming and retrofitting and, and repurposing what needs to be repurposed. And therefore you're basically helping in that brown to green transition, which is exactly what we, what we're looking for. And I think that is a power of this particular change in this narrative because it really brings that agency into, into financial institutions and it tells them, you have a part to play. Don't just be a, 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 a spectator of the transition. You'll really get involved and enable it. Be proactive in it. And I think that that changes a lot, a lot of things rather than being, yeah, rather than having something that's pretty static, like, like a classic standard asset narrative. Great, Natasha. You just talked about this a little, but I want to go into more detail. Uh, you speak in the, in the paper about taking a proactive and dynamic approach to managing a stranded loss with assets at risk. Uh -huh. Can you explain what that means in practice? You, you went to that a little bit, but a little more detail of what that would mean in practice. And do the financial institutions and from what you've seen have the capacity today to implement that kind of analysis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good question. So I did touch upon that a little bit in the previous answer, but to go a little more deeper into that, what we're talking about here, when we say, okay, shifting the narrative from stranded assets to assets at risk, which is much more dynamic, much more uh, systems level, a whole of economy lens, in fact, which basically means that you're looking at these risks across time horizons, across the entire value chain of this particular corporate entity, so the whole supply chain. You're looking at it also across your entire financial portfolio, so loans and borrowing, which is what banks generally tend to look at, but not only that, because again, that's a small part of their financial portfolio. We want them to look at uh, underwriting, securitization, advisory, facilitation, off balance sheet activities, all of this other stuff that uh, is not necessarily part of their net zero targets, the sector policies. If you analyze them, you'd see some of these net zero targets are really not all encompassing as they should be. So it's about not necessarily deploying something new, but just uh, making sure that what's already in place in terms of sector financing policies, net zero targets, alignment measures, are these really encompassing this whole of economy lens so that as a financial institution, you are being able to identify these potential standing risks, these potential assets at risk, um, and, and therefore being able to monitor them in a way that you're, that you're managing these risks, but you're also obviously deploying those transition finance flows that these entities need in order to transition so that you're not just offloading this risk to somebody else eventually you're not you're not you're not contributing to the amplification of these results of the real economy but they're really being an active agent in that and that's important and the second point also that's important to mention here is these assets yes we're talking about physical assets generally in this sense but these physical assets are obviously owned by well the corporate entity the sovereigns as well who were well, many of them own oil and gas assets but if we look beyond oil and gas in terms of other sectors as well it's owned by some particular entities, not the bank or the financial institution owning them. Nonetheless, they are they are connected to that because as the bank or the financier to this particular institution, you therefore are linked to them. And so it's important for you to be able to assess really what is the financial soundness of this particular entity, this particular sovereign to absorb those, those potential stranding risks. Because the problem wouldn't even exist uh, in terms of the, the, the significant financial losses that come from stranding, you, it wouldn't be that significant if the particular counterparty had the financial soundness eventually to absorb most of these stranding risks that are, that are coming in. So if it's somebody, some kind of an institute is like, okay, great, I have I have the financial backing and even if there's an unanticipated uh, loss eventually, some kind of asset stranding, I can absorb it, no problem. That's great. But as a bank, have you done the, the risk analysis to be sure that this particular counterparty is in fact financially sound and they do have to, and therefore they are credit worthy in that sense. So it's also very important to clarify that and to make sure that the banks understand and they, they, they improve their risk assessments so that they really get that. And so again, to answer your question in terms of what whether financial institutions have the capacity, they do because they've got these tools already. Like I mentioned, sector policies, we need to make sure that uh, these are really comprehensive, that they're covering all kinds of activities. There was a the, the report done recently called the Banking Climate Chaos, a very famous report. I think it was released last year, done by a bunch of NGOs uh, working on this topic and very good report and a lot of great insights in that. And they talk about the fact that a lot of these uh, sector policies of the biggest, the top banks in the world, 
uh, when they say they're not going to finance a particular uh, coal or project or overall the fossil fuel sector policies that they have, it's uh, generally limited to project related financing. And that's that's surprising because overall in fossil fuel financing, if, if you just look at that, not all of it is coming from project related financing. Most of it is just because these oil and gas companies obviously have banking partners. And so it's just a normal credit line, regular credit line that they have with them. It's not tied to a particular project. So it's important that sector financing policies are really comprehensive and they cover everything. And you're not just saying, okay, project financing is excluded and we don't do that anymore, but great, but you're doing everything else, right? And so why I say that, you might think, okay, what's net zero target got to do with stranding and sit? Well, it does, because eventually your, whatever risk you're identifying, the way you analyze your financial portfolio, the way you would like to, uh, the kind of science-based targets you're looking to eventually align with, all of this determines the net zero target that you eventually fix. And so if in that itself, your risk assessment is, is not complete because you haven't taken some part of your portfolio, you haven't taken some of these off balance sheet activities, well, then you're already missing out a bit of the risk, quite a bit of the risk, in fact. And you're exposing yourself to eventually these stranding risks, uh, these, these assets at risk that, I, that, that could be stranded. And with that, it's important to also say that it's not like all assets at risk become stranded, but all stranded assets are assets at risk. Because there is, of course, this agency that comes in again from the entity, the corporate entity, and the financial institution itself that says, yeah, okay, there is an asset at risk, but there is a chance for it to not be fully stranded. If you are proactively managing this, if you have seen this risk coming eventually and you've done the, the right risk, risk mitigation solution, you've helped this particular entity to either uh, transform its activities from brown to green, whether that's retrofitting, repurposing, you've done the early retirement, whatever these things may be, but you've therefore preemptively actually managed to reduce the, the these eventual uh, financial losses from stranding, save some of these assets even which needn't be stranded because that would be a waste. And at the same time, what really doesn't align, you help you, you retire those. And so in that sense, I think this this really clarifies the, the, the difference between what is truly stranded and what is not yet stranded, but could be if you don't act in advance. And so, yeah, so just to so just complete on this, I think it's important that banks understand we're not asking for new uh, tools here. We're not asking for something new because I know there's a lot of pressure on the banking industries. And we understand that the point here is that whatever you already have, you need to revise this further because you aren't considering enough of the risk that could eventually materialize in your books, precisely because some of these policies are non-comprehensive. All right. I I mean, you, you covered a lot of ground, Nadash, and, and I think that these are all incredibly important points to to think about and specifically for the financial sector and, and banking institutions. But I, I think it'd be helpful for our audience uh, to maybe put some numbers and timelines around all of this. I mean, you already made the point that this is not only about oil and gas and the paper does touch on the fact that there are other sectors impacted, real estate, agriculture, auto industry, others. Maybe you can give us a sense of the potential magnitude or dollar value. I mean, obviously, I understand maybe you don't have total clarity on what resides on all these, on the books, on the lending books of all these financial institutions. But do, do we have a sense of how big that is outside of oil and gas? And also, as important, is also the timeline. I mean, is this a 2030, 2050 problem? I mean, do, should we see this in the near term? Um, I mean, I'd love to get your perspective on this. And I, I may know the answer to this last question I'm going to ask. I mean, do you think these non-oil and gas sector losses, potential losses from asset at risk can exceed the numbers we're talking about when it comes to uh, oil and gas stranded assets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of really great questions, Navar. So, yes, uh, as I said, it's... It's it's not about trying to quantify these numbers because we know the issues that are linked to that and we know the perils as well of being too attached to that number and then saying, okay, I'm good, no, I'm unprotected from these issues. I know that I know my risk, I, I know how much I'm exposed to this and so I've made my buffer. But you know, that's obviously going to be an underestimation of what that final value will eventually look like as this particular sector, this economy de uh, decarbonizes. Even for the fossil fuel industry itself, when I was doing the research for the paper, I, I got such mind-bogglingly different, very, very diverse quantification numbers. There were some studies that were quantifying stranding losses from fossil fuels at like 1 trillion. Somebody said 5 trillion. Somebody said 60 trillion. One study even went to $185 trillion. Like, this is massive. So, I mean, forget about going to the other sectors. Even in the oil and gas industry, 
to which shunned assets has been already associated since so many years. So you would think we would have maybe a methodology by now, something more standard, something that really gives a sense of this number. Even there, we don't have it. So I mean, forget about the other sectors already. And why are these numbers different again? It's because we don't really know the pace of the transition, at least for the oil and gas industry, of course. Methodological assumptions that you're putting in in these different metal- in these different approaches, yeah, the scenarios, the data challenges, all of that stuff. So I mean, I don't, I don't really want to uh, try and try and look at what could those numbers look like. I'd, I'd rather like to look at how emission intensive the financial portfolios already are of some of these big banks, and and that's an interesting number there. So I, I was looking at the ECB stress test that we did last year, and in that, or it's, it's a stress test already that looks at beyond, of course, the fossil fuel sector because they, it's an energy stress test first of all, and it's the first time they did that, and it's a really good one because they look at. Yeah, what are these different uh, shocks that can happen to the financial system because of its emission intensity across sectors? And a proportion that stood out for me was that they found out that 40% of the total loan portfolio of the euro area banks are exposed to energy intensive sectors. So 40% of these banks are exposed to energy intensive sectors, which means you can you can ex- expect some kind of transition risk drivers coming in from that, whether it's, again, policy, market, or legal, whatever that might be, those numbers can get very big very fast. And so that maybe gives you a sense of the magnitude of the problem without really trying to quantify that because and that's going to be tricky. And then in looking at different sectors, yeah, that's that's the crux of the paper, actually, which I talk about in the first chapter. And that, that, that was the whole point of saying, OK, let's move beyond stranded assets in the fossil fuel sector and look at this dynamic concept of assets at risk across sectors or through a whole of economy lens. So I cover a few sectors. I cover buildings, for instance, where, as you know, yeah, buildings is a happily decarbonizing sector, but also one that's facing a lot of regulatory pressure as well in terms of uh, decarbonizing the building stock, especially in EU, you've got the European Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, which targets a fully decarbonized building stock by 2050 through various uh, minimum standards and requirements, particularly the EPC, the Energy Performance Certificates. So as a bank, you already have some of some of the indicators to be able to assess like, what could be the potential stranding effects of my real estate portfolio. Like, can I can I get a better sense of that, even if I don't really know the timeline? Okay, in this case, it's 2050, but between now and then, can I get a sense of what part of the stock might lose value because there's no resale value, because these clients are defaulting, because they can't, you know, so on and so forth. So can 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 I get a sense of that? And you can because you got APC certificates so or something that's at a G right now. You can imagine that maybe losing value pretty soon because again, like I said, your client, the household, the SME, the corporate, whoever owns that building is not able to finance it, is not able to resell it. But you can also complement that EPC information with other proxy information around the del- building. So know how what's the state of the building, when was it built, and all of that other stuff that's also publicly available. Um, would you able to get all the source of this different data and really get a better sense of what is the possible uh, stranding effect on this particular asset? So I cover buildings there uh, precisely because of just how big it is, at least in the EU context. Like buildings account for about 42% of the total EU energy usage. And of that, 80% just goes towards heating and cooling. So it's pretty massive and it's very important to look at that. Uh, especially when you look at it in the perspective of this 2050 target, you're like, okay, that's a big part of the building stock that needs to decarbonize very, very quickly. There's also one very interesting one, which is the agricultural sector. So this was a study done by my teammates uh, last year. It's only limited to France. Uh, I mean, the study was based in France. And it's interesting because the agricultural sector is a sector that actually faces both physical uh, climate effects and also transition climate effects. So physical climate effects, of course, from physical climate events and transition effects from regulatory pressure to decarbonize and reduce emission intensity of operations. And my teammates found out that in France, the highest risk of acid stranding in the agricultural sector, particularly for livestock farming, actually came from just the buildings and the, and the stock. You would think it would be from crops, but not really. It was actually from the buildings and the infrastructure that they were using on their farms because these were very old and energy, energy intensive buildings. And again, there are directives in France that need to decarbonize their operations. And so what, they, what they're actually doing is rather than trying to retrofit these existing buildings, the existing building stock because it's too expensive, they're investing rather in cheaper new buildings. That made more sense for them and is making more sense for them. And, and that's crazy when you think about it. Like you're literally abandoning. This is like a very clear case of asset stranding. You're literally stranding the existing build, building stock and taking whatever loss there is because these buildings do have residual value. They're still very much usable, even if they're energy intensive. But you're bearing the loss as a breeder, as an individual livestock breeder, and you're just investing in new buildings. And why is this problem exacerbated? Well, it's exacerbated even further by the financial industry, by the banks who 
Traditionally, of course, we know that agriculture sector is not a very uh, profitable, uh, attractive sector rather for the financial institutions, private financial institutions at least. So a bank is really not that incentivized to finance an agricultural uh, or livestock breeder because it's just it's just not an attractive risk reward profile. And so this is what's happening. And probably another example that I'd like to touch on, I know it's a long answer, but like this is the crux of the paper, is about the automobile sector. And this one is very, very interesting because it's probably one of the only examples where you see the effects, um, the potential effects rather of asset stranding on both sides of the equation. So on the side, which is uh, the auto manufacturers who are having to transition quickly and transform their business lines quickly from ICE or internal combustion engines to EV fleets, do that quickly uh, in order to meet these regulatory deadlines. In Europe, as you know, there's a 2035 ban for the sale of ICE vehicles. So they're having to meet that and prepare for that. And they've already started preparing for that. But at the same time, on the other side of the equation, you've got players on the green side of the equation. So players who are trying to incubate and mature the EV market who are also suffering, not necessarily because of this direct and they're, really, they're trying to enable that, right? But they're suffering because of other market-driven transition effects. I'm sure you're probably aware of the the, the North World saga going on in Europe right now where you've got North World, which is this uh, this big startup based in Sweden uh, and they're, they're, they're really hemorrhaging right now, hemorrhaging uh, cash and they're, making, they're, they're incurring a lot of losses just because EV demand in Europe has slowed down. Now, did anybody see this coming? I'm not sure. Uh, did the bank see this coming? Was it sufficiently anticipated when they were analyzing, let's say, the risk profile of North World? Maybe, maybe not. But what remains right now is that this is a company that's suffering, even though it's got, it had a good financial backup as a startup. And the reason it's suffering has got nothing to do too much with, with what's happening here in Europe, but just the fact that the market is changing so quickly, you've got cheaper cars coming in from China, very cost efficient, targeting the low and mid-range market having a good uptake from there and just not enough demand right now on the, on the European consumer side because, again, not having, you know, all of these typical uh, reasons in terms of infrastructure, charging points, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very interesting because it covers on both sides. It tells you, right, asset stranding is not something that only comes from this transformation from brown to green, but it could also really come from just trying to deploy those green assets because you haven't uh, sufficiently understood, uh, let's say, whole of economy lens of the equation. Because when you say whole of economy, this would be one of those things, right? You look at not just what would be the regulatory impact, but what are the other market factors that, that could really drive this effect of asset stranding on this particular asset, on this particular industry as it decarbonizes? And what could therefore be the obstacle to that as well. So I think this was a very interesting example. And uh, I don't mention the North World thing because this just happened right now. But uh, I think this is this is super interesting. That leads well into our, our last question. We're going to give you a lot of power. We're going to give you a magic wand. If there's one regular regulatory reform you can propose to address you know, the asset at risk issue, what would it be? How would you fix all this? <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> um, right. I mean, there there are many things. So yeah, it's it's a multi pronged problem, a multi prism problem that needs a multi prism solution. There's not one thing that can fix it, of course. And we've got mandatory transition plans rolling out now in Europe. That should be a game changer. That should help banks to really start looking at uh, how they're going to transition. But I think what's really really going to be important here from the regulatory point of view are just the regulatory expectations and guidelines around how do you really measure the transition readiness of a counterparty in the face of this transition, right? How do you really identify uh, which counterparty is ready in terms of like whatever parameters you define? And you really try to assess that in terms of, yes, it's, it's business, it's asset or composition. Because what the banks suffer with a lot today is that, all right, we've got the taxonomy. We have taxonomy tells you what's already green, but how do you really relate, let's say the color of the asset on this, on the shades of green, how do you do that? How do you relate that? I mean, with the transition risk assessment. And the NGFS, the Network for Building the Financial System, they did an interesting report about this two, three years ago, where they, they also mentioned the same point that the banks really do suffer with really trying to transpose the greenness of an asset with the transition readiness of a counterparty. So they're going to know, all right, I get this asset is brown and I get that, okay, it's, it's, it's not compatible, but how does that translate eventually into a transition risk? Because a transition risk, again, it's not, we should be looking at it in isolation. Like, as I just pointed out in the example earlier for the EV industry, it's 
all these different factors also coming in together. It's is the credit worthiness of this particular counterparty. It's other market factors also that could just affect the financial soundness of this. That could be non climatic factors. It's not climate is not a thing by in and of itself, right? So then it becomes uh, very difficult for them to see. Okay, how do I really solve that? How do I say okay, this particular asset I can see that it's uh, this particular counterparty. I mean, I can see it's got a good amount of brown assets right now. But I can somehow also assess that okay, it's got a transition plan, and I and I know it it, it has a very clear uh, net zero t- target. But how do I say that it's going to be better than its peer? Like what helps me determine the transition risk uh, of this relative to its peers in the same segment? That's what they struggle with now because they're using things like uh, heat maps and scenario analysis and stress tests and proprietary tools and all of these different things. But it's difficult without that regulatory expectation, with that without the regulatory guidelines that tells them okay, these are the kind of parameters they should be looking at, and that could even help like standardize it a little bit rather than every, rather than people having different kinds of risk perceptions as well on the same counterparty, and nobody really knows how, who, and and to what extent I should be financing each particular counterparty based on this transition trajectory. And it's very proprietary for the moment. So until we are talking the same language and we really understand how, how to better assess this transition risk, and therefore with that, of course, a standing risk that comes from that, I think it will still be very heterogeneous. And that, this is where we are today. It's, it's very pretty really heterogeneously managed. And uh, and, and yeah, and, and this is something that only regulation can do because it's not something that the, that the market can solve by itself, I think. Well, thanks, Natasha. That's, that was a fantastic conversation. I really think people should you know read your paper, Stranded Assets at Risk. Thanks for mentioning the uh, Banking on Climate Chaos report. Uh, that's a good one as well. People should check out. It comes out every year. And you can see the trends of how things are or are not improving. Again, thanks for joining us. People can reach out to you or either of us on LinkedIn or other social media, but we're mostly on LinkedIn if they want to connect with us a little bit more. If you're interested in anything else ED4S is doing, you can find us at ed4s.org. Take care. Thanks again.